Good day, everyone. Welcome to Crime Talk. First on the docket today, the Koberger alibi. The George Kelly jurors, well, they're deliberating. The jury is selected in the alleged hush money trial for Donald Trump. I told you this was coming, and you mocked me and our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. Lawyer. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased true crime channel there is anywhere in the world. Let's go ahead and get to the docket. First, the Brian Koberger alibi. Now, we talked briefly about this, and, you know, let's be clear. We like to go directly to the pleadings uh, when we uh, have availability to those, and I want to just uh, read this verbatim so it's absolutely clear what he is saying his alibi is or isn't, okay? So as you may recall, the prosecutors uh, noted that Brian Koberger's phone was inactive between 2.47 a.m. and 4.48 a.m. on the night of the murders. Keep that in mind, okay? So let's get to it. Comes now Brian Koberger by and through his attorney of record, Ann Taylor, public defender, hereby supplements the response to the demand for alibi in compliance with the Idaho Code Section 19-519 and the Idaho Criminal Rules 12.1. Mr. Koberger moves to Pullman, Washington in June of 2022. As an avid runner and hiker, he explored many areas of the Palouse, P-A-L-O-U-S-E. I hope I got that right. Of note, he explored Wawaway, W-A-W-A-W-A-I Park, in July of 2022, and this became his favorite location. After the school year began, Mr. Koberger was busy with classes and work at Washington State University, and his running and hiking uh, decreased but did not stop. Instead, his nighttime drives increased. This is supported by the data from Mr. Koberger's phone, showing him in the countryside late at night and or in the early morning on several occasions. The phone data includes numerous photographs taken on several different late evenings and early mornings, including in November, depicting the night sky. Mr. Koberger was driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, as he did, as he often did to hike and run or to see the moon and the stars. He drove throughout the area south of Pullman, Washington, west of Moscow, Idaho, including the Huawei, W-A-W-A-W-A-I Park, common pronunciation, partial corroboration. Mr. Koberger intends to offer testimony of Cy Ray, CSLI expert, cell phone tower, cell phone, and other radio frequency uh, curriculum vitae is attached, which we'll go over in just a second, to show that Brian Koberger's mobile device was south of Pullman, Washington and west of Moscow, Idaho on November 13th, 2022. Brian Koberger's mobile device did not travel east on the Moscow-Pullman Highway in the early morning hours of November 13th and thus could not be the vehicle captured on video along the Moscow-Pullman highway near Floyd's Cannabis Shop. Additional information as to Mr. Koberger's whereabouts as the early morning hours progressed, including additional analysis by Mr. Ray, will be provided once the state provides discovery requested and now subject to an upcoming motion to compel. If not disclosed, Mr. Ray's testimony will also reveal the critical exculpatory evidence further corroborating Mr. Koberger's alibi was either not preserved or has been withheld. So there you go. He's out looking at the stars, driving around. Got it. And they say that the that this is basically corroborated that he's done this on other evenings, which would make you think that, hmm, maybe there's some validity to the prosecution's belief that his, his being Brian Koberger's phone, was turned off between 2.47 and 4.48 a.m. in the morning. Uh, they were very vague in this disclosure, and I think that is significant and something to obviously look at. Clearly, if there was something that says at approximately the time of the murders, he was here, 
They just say he's in the vicinity and we don't really know where other than he's out looking at the stars and that they have other photos that were taken on several different late evenings and early mornings, including in November. Now, they didn't specifically say on November 13th. Now, did they? Interesting, interesting, interesting. Now, they're saying, and there is a motion that was filed, but it's under seal, so we can't get to it as it relates to discovery. So the defense is saying there should be more information out there that their experts should be allowed to uh, receive and get and to interpret that data. Now, who is the expert? Um, I've never worked with this gentleman, Cy Ray. Um, he works at uh, Burning Mountain Productions, doing business as the Socialite Crime Club from 2023 to present. Uh, and he is the president executive producer. Um, prior to that, he worked for LexisNexis Special Services. He works for ZX Inc. He was the president and founder uh, and that was in uh, Chandler, Arizona. He worked with the Gilbert Police Department, the Phoenix Training Council, Show Slow Police Department, and he also has military service. And he's done some military training of uh, other police officers in Afghanistan. Now he lists lots of experience as a as a general police officer, SWAT training officer, etc. And then in the, under his field of expertise, he has cell phone and radio frequency device expertise. He states that he has extensive background in cellular devices in reference to criminal investigations, subject matter expert in call detailed record analysis, historical tracking, real-time physical tracking of mobile devices, geolocation, site survey, and RF identification. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that is not particularly that hard to do. When you get these printouts, you can plug these coordinates into uh, Google and it'll plot uh, these locations for you. He claims to have extensive use of DRT tracking equipment, which is digital receiver technology, technical applications of roads and swartz, uh, TSME and TSMA scanning equipment, expert, or I'm sorry, experience in denial of service, RF jamming, and data collection, black phone operations, which includes identifying and targeting unknown cellular devices. That's just where they ping your phone when they need to find you to arrest you. And he apparently was designed and developed radio frequency sensors that detect wireless devices, sensors that were used uh, by the NFL during the 2016 Super Bowl for drone protection. Now, one thing I will note that um, Mr. Cy Ray um, lists a lot of experience, which is all good. That's all it takes to be an expert is that you have some sort of experience and expertise. You don't have to have a fancy formal degree or anything along those lines. Now, I have used experts in the past and some of them are former police officers with very similar type of information uh, that they provide as to their skills. I've also used electrical engineers that will be able to show that a phone could be on, but due to the terrain, uh, the signals would not be reaching the phone, but it could still be on. So I'm not criticizing anything because I haven't seen anything from Cy Ray, but I'm just saying from my experience, I think I would want a scientific expert to be able to explain, was the phone really inactive between 247 and 448 or just out of reach or unable to connect to a cell phone tower? That is what I would be more interested in rather than cell phone data uh, information. Now, the police, uh, I mean, it's basically alleged that they, the prosecution, released or, or didn't disclose, save, preserve information that the defense now believes to be exculpatory. Well, most of that information would have been in the possession of the cell phone carrier, not the police. So I'd be curious to see what exactly the defense is alleging. Um, once again, I just don't see that as a prosecution problem in this particular case. Anyway, I wanted to discuss that with you. Yesterday was very, very quick. We had uh, just got the information. I had a, a tough day in court, and I just wanted to make sure we got that out there that the alibi has arrived. But let's just say I'm not impressed. Let's just say I'm not impressed. 
Um, it's basically saying, hey, I don't have a person that I can say that I was with, but if you read between the lines of my cell phone data, it's possible that I could have been out at a park looking at the sky on the night in question. We'll see if Mr. Koberger also takes the stand to explain his whereabouts and possibly explain that pesky DNA evidence. Next on the docket, the jury is deliberating in the George Kelly matter. That's right. Deliberations are underway in the trial of the 75-year-old rancher accused of fatally shooting a Mexican citizen who was found dead on his 100-acre um, ranch just outside the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, George Kelly is charged with second-degree murder and two counts of aggravated assault for the uh, shooting death of the Mexican national, a migrant from Nogales, Mexico, on January 30th of 2023. Now, prosecutors have accused Kelly of ambushing the uh, migrant who was unarmed and headed away from Kelly's residence with a group of other migrants. Now, the county attorney has also accused Kelly of prejudicial malice, pointing to text messages that demonstrate his propensity for violence toward the victim's race, ethnicity, national origin, and or immigration status. Now, Mr. Kelly's attorneys say that he heard a shot and fired a shot over the head of a group of five men who had rifles and large backpacks. But as the lead detective noted, um, there's no evidence of a five-person group, nor evidence that anyone other than Kelly fired a gun that day. Now, the detective says he thinks that Kelly deliberately aimed towards the man who died, but the defense attorney has suggested again and again that George Kelly did not fire the shot that killed the victim. She suggests the victim was involved in a smuggling and that other smugglers shot him to steal money, drugs, or guns, whatever they were smuggling. Now, the police did find nine shell casings outside of Kelly's house in a pattern consistent with the shots fired toward the deceased man. But there is no ballistic test to match the fatal bullet to Kelly's gun because that bullet went through the victim and was never recovered. We will be on the uh, deliberation watch, and uh, if they're going to allow it to be streamed live, we will bring it to you. Oh, a further note, I should note that the, the uh, defense case for Mr. Kelly rested without Mr. Kel Kelly testifying in his own defense, probably because investigators have testified that uh, Kelly's story kept changing about the incident, which as we saw in the tubing uh, case uh, just the other week. Um, if you can't explain why your story changed, and in that particular case, why somebody lied, yeah, juries don't like that. Juries don't like that. His wife was a much better witness to say this is what happened. Came across as, I believe, credible, at least what I saw. From. Next on the docket, we have a jury. The full jury of seven men and five women has been selected with members including an investment banker and a speech therapist who admits he uh, doesn't like the uh, former president's policies. Now, the uh, court has to uh, select uh, a few more alternates, but uh, that was uh, chosen uh, late last night. So since the Trump legal team has used all of their strikes to get rid of the potential jurors, guess what? We have a jury. I wish this was televised. You would think the court in this particular case would say, hey, we have a former president. We have the former president running to be the next president. You would think that they would think that of is, is of some significance uh, for the world to see, one, if it was a fair proceeding, two, can the prosecution meet their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt to show that this was something that Donald Trump knew about and authorized or when these bills came in, did the accountant simply classify them as legal expenses, not knowing the extent of them? I'm not sure the prosecution is going to be able to show that the president was involved in the intricacies of um, classifying various expenses uh, in the organization. We will have to wait and see. If it was only live, we'd all be able to see it as it happened. Maybe next time. Next, I told you this was going to happen. And yes, people mocked me and they said, Scott, we needed justice. We needed justice and doesn't this feel good? And I said, just wait, just because this one prosecutor did it and they succeeded in the Crumley case, guess what? Now we got another prosecutor doing it. 
and next time they could be coming for you. So the um, Virginia prosecutors uh, noted Thursday that uh, the uh, they will be pursuing the case against a former assistant principal indicted on a felony child neglect charge at the elementary school where a six-year-old shot a teacher last year and um, suggested others could be charged in the investigation as the investigation continues. Now, a day after the special grand jury report outlining the case against ex-administrator Ebony Parker um, was made public, the um, Commonwealth's Attorney General Howard Gwynn told reporters that he was troubled by the findings and believes the charge is warranted. He added that he had never brought a charge against a school administrator or heard of it being done as it relates to this type of case, but we go where the facts lead us, he said. Now, the shooting at the Rich Neck Elementary School in Newport News, Virginia on January 6th of 2023 obviously was big news and it brought to the attention the school safety and it stunned the community when police announced that the child's actions appeared to be intentional. Now, obviously, it's rare to be char for charges to be brought against parents, administrators, or other adults when a child commits gun violence, not only at school, but anywhere else. But some people are suggesting that the uh, recent involuntary manslaughter trials of the Michigan parents of a teenage school shooter who killed four classmates and where the parents were for the first time ever held responsible for a mass shooting committed by the child set that legal precedent so that now other prosecutors can go forward. So the case in Newport News, a six-year-old student who was never named used a nine millimeter handgun to shoot his teacher, Abigail Zwerner, while she sat at a reading table in the first grade classroom. She was injured but survived and managed to escort the class of about 15 students to safety. On the day of the shooting, Parker, Richneck's assistant principal at the time, was made aware by other staff and students of on four occasions that the child might be a potentially dangerous threat, according to the grand jury report. Anyway, Parker's lack of response and initiative, given the seriousness of the information she had that she received on January 6th, is shocking, the report notes, adding that it was an avoidable situation. Now, uh, Parker, who happens to have a PhD in education, resigned in the wake of the shooting and now has been charged with eight counts of felony child abuse, each one representing the number of bullets that the boy had in the gun. Well, she appeared in a hearing the other day with her uh, attorney, and uh, the uh, matter has been uh, set uh, next month uh, before a trial date will be set. She faces up to five years for each of the counts, eight counts times five, 40 years. Really? How symbolic. See, now we're getting into symbolism. One count for each bullet in the gun, ladies and gentlemen. My goodness. Why not somebody just have the gun just charge them all with attempted murder because they have 15 rounds in the gun? This is where it's going, ladies and gentlemen. And people said, oh, Scott, you don't know what you're talking about. The Crumley case is different. They had so much information. Why don't you just shut up and go along with everybody else? Because it makes us all feel so good that we have justice. And, you know, Ethan Crumley is going to spend the rest of his life in prison, but those parents are evil, bad persons. Where does it stop, ladies and gentlemen? Why stop at the assistant principal? Why not the teacher? Why didn't she spot this early on, right? Maybe she could almost be complicit, at least reduce any exposure on the civil side. Why didn't she notice the danger? How about the whole school? Maybe the maybe the lady uh, working in the cafeteria as well. I mean, she probably came in contact with the kid and she did nothing. You see why it's a dangerous precedent, ladies and gentlemen, when you start getting into feelings in criminal cases and you get out of a true mens rea, what somebody knowingly did, what you can prove, not a negligence standard, which is you should have known. You should have known what a reasonable person would have done. Yeah, we don't really do that in the criminal justice system, but now I guess it's acceptable because it makes everybody feel really good. Now, remember the mom in this particular case, they didn't charge her with this neglect in state court. No, 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 no. They charged her with obtaining a gun because she was addicted to marijuana when she bought the gum and she lied on the little forms. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. What do they say? Show me the man, I'll show you the crime. They can get any one of you 
or any of us as long as they decide that day I pick you. You think the law should be specific, what's strictly prohibited, and the mental state required. Just something to think about. And finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. A Texas woman went on a cruise and left her children, you know, just an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, uh, home alone. Now, it was a pretty nice place because it cost $3,600 a month to rent. But according to the criminal complaint, the neighbors of Lakeisha Woods Williams spotted her departing the apartment on April 4th with luggage and bags and never saw her return to that particular location. Now, aware that the children may have been left in the 21st floor apartment, which has a small balcony, a witness called police. Uh, police who visited the complex on April 9th discovered the two children in the apartment, which was in complete disarray and had trash and uh, leftover food all over the uh, apartment. And apparently there was a strong odor of urine to go with that uh, disarray. Now the uh, children stated to the police that their mother had left them since April 4th to go on vacation on a cruise, and they didn't know when she would return. The boy used a phone to text his mom while she was vacationing, according to the police. And um, Ms. Williams was allegedly uh, was using to, a police officer did, however, find a webcam that Ms. Williams allegedly was using to watch uh, the children while she was away on her vacation. Well, as you can expect, the children were examined by emergency service personnel and they were uh, taken out of the custody of Ms. Williams and given to the custody of an aunt. Now, when the police did contact Ms. Williams, she apparently was uncooperative and refused to come back home and was switching up her story about her whereabouts, according to the affidavit for the arrest warrant. Well, after an April 12th court hearing, the judge ordered Ms. Williams, who was busted on felony child abandonment, locked up on a $25,000 bond, calling her conduct egregious in nature and the witness accounts that this is not the first time something like this has taken place. Well, Miss Williams remains in custody and her next arraignment is June 11th. So I guess Miss Williams has learned, hey, you just need to abandon your kids. You don't need to go on vacation. You just go down to the local pokey, sit in the jail and, uh, you know, unwind, get away from the kids. Should have just done that, but no. Anyway, Miss Williams, you are a dumb criminal of the day. All right, I wanna thank everybody for watching. We truly do appreciate you taking the time to watch Crime Talk. We'll see you next week. And remember, yes, the Constitution matters.